So academic language, there's not really an official formal definition of academic language, but it refers to more than just vocabulary and grammar and reading, writing, listening, and speaking. And this is probably why so many of you have been concerned and confused in regard to using academic language in light of the ed TPA. So academic language is oral, written, auditory, and visual language that is required to learn effectively in schools and academic programs. It's a language used in classroom lessons, books, tests, and assignments. It's a language students are expected to learn and achieve fluency in. It's often different from it's always actually, not often, it's always different from the language that they use to talk to their friends, to their families, to people outside of school. It's not the language that typically people talk in, in everyday speak. And so that is one of the things that's very different is that academic language is solely used when they're at school and solely used when they're talking in f more formal contexts, which is not typically what they're, you know, going to be speaking in in everyday life. It's a meta language that helps learners acquire more than 50,000 words that they're expected to have internalized by the end of high school. It includes everything from illustration and chart literacy to speaking, grammar, and genres within fields. It's the verbal clothing we don in the classroom. I loved that quote so that I just included that as the top but think of academic language as the verbal clothing we don in classrooms it's other and in other formal contexts that demonstrate cognition within cultures and signal college readiness there are two kinds of academic language first is instructional language so like what textual clues support your analysis things that teachers would say, summarize, compare and contrast, so that's instructional language, or it's the language of the discipline, so examples would be like alliteration in English, or axioms in math, or class struggle in social studies, or atoms in science, or treble clefs in music, it, whatever the language of the discipline is, and no student comes to school adept in academic discourse, so thoughtful instruction is required. So terms to refer to academic language include um, academic English. Sometimes people will, call, will say that it's academic English, and they use that synonymously with academic language, given that academic language is the dominant language used in public schools. Um, academic literacy is sometimes also used interchangeably, but they do differ from you know, place to place. So um, when academic language is taught and monitored in schools, which like in the ed TPA's case and in Washington state how it's important for teachers to do this, it's called academic language development or ALD. And so when you're talking or thinking about academic language and teaching it specifically to students, that's what you're doing. You're developing their academic language. So for native English speakers, the development of academic language builds progressively on conversation skills because native English speakers come into school already having the basics and they already speak English, but they're speaking it conversationally and so they don't have these vocabulary words that prepare them to um, read in textbooks and to conversate with people in more formal context. The challenge for English language learners, if you have any um, ELLs in your classrooms, is that they are learning both at the same time. They're being taught an academic language, but they don't even know conversational language. So they're trying to learn both of those at the same time, and it's even more difficult. The acquisition of academic language can also conflict with cultural identities. For example, students of color, ethnic minorities, or English language learners may feel they're being forced to learn a style of language they associate with a cultural group they may feel excluded from because academic English or the English used in schools is associated with white middle-class America or with highly educated groups and so when they come into school and they're speaking something like you know Spanglish or they're speaking African American language that is sometimes at odds because we expect them to 
speak in this formal academic English at school, which is not something that is valued within their cultural groups. So sometimes there's tensions between, um, you know, racial, ethnic, or socioeconomic um, backgrounds that can cause these feelings, and students feel like their their families, um, you know, and the school are kind of in conflict. So <clears throat> correcting urban slang in a writing assignment um, may be felt like a, cr a personal criticism by the student rather than something that um, they view as we're trying to help them with their academic English and to help them to become more successful in school. It is really a hard um, a hard part to navigate because you have to figure out what the students are bringing with them to school and how to acknowledge that and how to be culturally responsive and give them you know respect for for what their cult their home culture is without um, making them feel bad but they do have to learn academic English in order to be successful in the context of school and in the context of probably in in business and in their you know future jobs and so it's an interesting dichotomy and almost like a binary at times where students are speaking a whole different form of English at home and a, for, a whole different form of language at home versus what they speak at school. And it's not an easy thing to navigate, but th that's something that you do need to realize is that most students, they speak English, of course, but they're not bringing that kind of English that you expect them to use in school. They're speaking a different kind of English. So who needs ALD, academic language development? Everybody everybody needs it particularly though students with cognitive or developmental delays so our IEPs our students with 504s students who live in unsupportive dysfunctional or unstable environments because they may not have books at home they may not have parents that are educated parents that have gone to college um, ch children from high poverty low education or otherwise disadvantaged backgrounds who enter school without those basic language and literacy skills it goes along with the same um, you know with my literacy background the <clears throat> students that enter school that have not had reading or not have had books at home they come into school even in kindergarten with millions of words deficient compared to students that have had books at home and have parents reading to them and it continues and by the time that they get into you know middle school and high school they are you know millions and millions and millions of words behind those other students so there are a number of factors that influence acquisition of academic language, including language modeling that students receive at home. So just like I said, it's how their, their parents talk. It's how they hear other people talking at home. Um, if their parents correct their language errors or explain the meanings of words at home versus if they don't, if they use a diverse vocabulary at home versus parents who don't, if there are books in the home, if they encourage their children to read or do they even talk about those books at home. So there's lots of different things that can um, count as language modeling. It may even be the types of TV programs that they watch and how the parents talk about that. Um, intentional English language modeling is more common in wealthier, higher educated English speaking households and it's often not um, present in disadvantaged or non-English speaking home environments. So conversational versus formal language, there are lots of differences. The differences include grammar, um, vocabulary, punctuation, syntax. Syntax is like how the words are put together, how the um, how the sentences, if they're very complex sentences versus very simple sentences. There are discipline specific terminology, like I mentioned, the axioms or, you know, alliteration in English, and then rhetorical conventions of how you actually use the language to convince people or to um, 
portray emotions and remember rhetoric includes those logos ethos and pathos and people use those in their day-to-day -day talking without even realizing it but in academic English it's used differently and you're, it's not going to have as much emotions. It's going to be more logical. It's going to have more ethos because we're citing sources and we're making sure that we, what we are talking about refers to things that are valid. But in conversational English, you're using more ethos, or sorry, more pathos because you're trying to evoke more emotions. Most of the time, there's a lot more storytelling in conversational language. Um, and so it's a it's a whole different format comparatively so there are lots of different differences okay so competency in academic language bleeds into a wide variety of related um, non-linguistic skills that are difficult and impossible to separate from language ability so foundational academic skills such as organizing planning or researching cognitive skills such as critical thinking, problem solving, interpreting, analyzing, memorizing, recalling. So all of these things that are part of academic success in school but may not necessarily be related to them writing or reading. So those are important. The learning modes, how they question, how they discuss, what they what they even notice when they're in class or what they are observing how they do how they theorize about things that are happening or experiment work habits so once again persistence self discipline curiosity conscientiousness responsibility and then what about these other forms of literacy such as technological literacy online literacy media literacy multicultural literacy lots of other literacies that I didn't include either and so academic language can affect all of these other things when students are lacking in that because it's going to help them to understand some of these more complex things. So um, due to the linguistic irregularities um, slang, idioms, those different things. Learning academic English can be challenging in particular for non-native speakers so they don't understand like why do we say embarrassment instead of embarrassness or embarrasshood? Why do we say shyness instead of shyment or shyhood? And there, it doesn't really stick because we can't just use all of the grammar rules and apply them to all of them because we have so many irregular of irregular words in English but not just grammatical rules academic English also requires like just different things that we have to know such as the metric system or different mathematical terms or signs or knowing the context and knowing that a product in math means something different than a product in business or what does inflation in economics means compared to inflating a bicycle tire or what about a bug in software coding versus a bug that's on your floor? So, and there's lots of different things like that that we really have to think about. So, one of the first things that you could do is you're figuring out what words to identify as academic English in your lesson plans is to start with those tier two words and what they describe as tier two words are the words that you use in your instruction. So this was the first types of academic English that I was talking about a couple slides ago is that they're not the lesson's primary learning objective but they're critical that students understand what they mean in order to process what's happening in the classroom. So they appear in Common Core Standards, they're on standardized tests and they appear in our classroom all the time. They're words such as paraphrase, summarize, predict, justify. I brought these up I think during class and I have mentioned these but when you say explain or describe or um, comprehend, those are all tier two words that are academic English. Students have to know what you mean when you mean explain or um, examine or synthesize. They don't know what those mean. And co to be honest, a lot of teachers don't know um, what they mean specifically because they'll talk about that we're going to discuss but then the teachers discussing the whole time and that's not really what discussion is so we ha do have to think about how we use these specific words in instruction and not use 
you know, them synonymously at times when they're not synonyms. There are eight other strategies that you could use to help improve academic literacy and that you could identify in your um, ed TPA lesson plans. Encourage students to read diverse text, introduce summary frames, help students translate from academic to social language and back again, complete scripts of academic routines if they're doing presentations. I'm going to go into more depth on these. Dynamically introduce academic vocabulary, help them diagram similarities and differences, write with a transition handout, and maybe teach keywords so they can understand objectives and test prompts. So reading diverse texts, think about you know the differences in genres and how students could learn if they were reading from a textbook or an academic text or a primary source and how those readings um, could differ but also those types of things that they would need to know in order to navigate those different varieties of text. They're also going to encounter different vocabulary based on the types of text that they're reading and I think that sometimes encountering words that are perhaps synonyms or perhaps easier versions of the words, maybe in a picture book or a fiction book, and then encountering it in the textbook or in the academic text, they may already have that, you know, they'll be able to get the context clue and figure out what they mean. Um, introduce summary frames. I think helping them to learn how to summarize could also help um, get them familiar. So if the main point of the paragraph is problem solution, you could have give them this um, blank and they would just fill it in so so and so wanted blank but this happened so this other thing happened so it was caught problem and solution or what decision they decided cause and effect such and such ha such and such happens because of this other thing that happened academic to social language you could model how to say something in more academic way or paraphrase it into a more conversational way so they could go back and forth provide students with difficult um, texts and have the teams reinterpret it into everyday um, language even text speak or other Englishes I also I keep thinking about how students use emoticons they use all of these different ways of communicating now that are not academic but it's their everyday language. You could also give them scripts for academic routines, maybe you know helping them figure figure out how to start their presentations. The topic of my presentation is blah 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 and so they have that to begin with and if they want to vary once they be, get familiar with it but I think it gives them those um, discourse words and to figure out how to navigate the you know academic landscape. In the first part I'll give a few basic definitions. In the next section I'll explain blank blank blank. In part three I'm going to show you know whatever and so to help them to understand how they would present this information and model it for them. Um, introducing academic vocabulary dynamically, uh, encountering the, the um, vocabulary in authentic context can help them to really internalize the definitions. If they hear you using it or you use it in a funny way or you tell a personal story and use that word somewhere within the story. You show a picture of what the word means. Read it within the story that they will read. Show a video that has the word being used. Find it being used in real ways. Any of those things that can provide that authentic context where they see that this isn't just some word that they randomly use in English class or in social studies class, but that they'll use in their real lives. Similarities and differences. We've talked about graphic organizers and you've probably talked about them in every single education class that you've had but completing Venn diagrams, T-charts, other graphic organizer, organizers to show relationships of concepts such as similarities and differences or you know cause and effect or anything like that and this is one of Marzano's high yield instructional strategies so anytime that you use graphic organizers to help students understand and to process what they're learning it can really help them and that is an academic vocabulary concept 
teaching key words, helping them to learn what it means to analyze, what it means to describe. And I had talked about this already, but students and teachers often use words interchangeably, but you need to define them for yourself. What do you mean when you say examine? What do you mean? And what do you think that those words actually um, look like in performance from your teacher or from your students so that you can explain to your students what you mean when you say these words. Now you need to read the text academic language function. After reading that text click over to the Google form. So let me show you the text. It's academic language function toolkit and you'll click through there um, and then go ahead and read what it says about academic language. So there's a little bit more information about developing academic language in your core content, building functional language. There's some um, pedagogy suggestions or strategies that can help you. Um, how some of those are the high yield strategies mentioned by Marzano. Um, and there are things that you guys will be able to use in your um, future classrooms with some great suggestions. I think this will also help you as you're going through and developing your ed TPAs. So go ahead and look through. I know there's a lot of pages, but there's a lot of diagrams, so it won't take you too long to read through and, and check everything out and maybe get a better idea of what academic language could be and is. So go ahead and do that. Once you're finished with that, click over to the Google form and this will just be kind of an assessment of all of your learning about academic language. So type your name, what does academic language mean? Answer that question in your own words and then you're going to choose which of the methods suggested um, is the most likely. So I just want you to choose one of these. Which one do you think is the most likely to influence your teaching? Which one do you think that you would use the most? And then answer that question. Does academic language influence other school competencies and then what did you learn how can this help you with your ed TPA and go ahead and select submit once you're finished with that and it will help them